So that was a wonderful introduction. I thank you. But I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and, and that's so, okay. That's what I did. Uh, and I did it at Syracuse University for oh, 12 years. And I love my work. I'm a professor emeritus now, actually. So I'll be retired uh, one year into that. And I'm still trying to figure that out. But uh, what I've been trying to do uh, more recently uh, is to think about how to apply all of that to our everyday life. And uh, I still haven't figured out that either, but I'm going to give it a try. And uh, so I'm going to talk about some of the uh, research in memory uh, and how it has implications for everyday life, especially for us older adults. And I include myself in that group now that I'm retired. Now that I'm 71 years old. So, um, let's see. Um, yeah, thank you for being here. I attended the talk uh, last time. I enjoyed it very much. This looks like a great series. Um, of speakers and interesting topics. Um, so uh, some of the things that the person last time mentioned uh, was about memory. Uh, and some of the things the person next time will mention uh, will be about hearing and uh, perceptions. Uh, and I include both of those uh, topics in what I'm going to be doing. So just a rough outline, um, I, I want to talk about memory not just as uh, remembering things, remembering facts or events or data or information, but as uh, something that gives us uh, the tools or the material for developing knowledge and developing skills and expertise. Memory as something that um, is part of us, our personality, our, uh, who we think we are, all of our lifetime of experiences is our memory, in a sense, and created by our memory. Uh, the material that we use for thinking and making good decisions comes from the material that we have remembered from past experiences, from the media, from other sources. Um, our memory protects us from uh, <clears throat> insults uh, in some ways, how we filter uh, the information that is uh, confronted, the, the information that we confront, the information that is said to us, and, uh, that, that is presented to us. And also, our memory uh, serves to enhance our, uh, our self-concept sometimes, where we think of ourselves, the things that we remember are oftentimes the more positive aspects of things that are said about us, all within, uh, within perspectives or hopes. So um, also, memory allows predictions about future events and experiences. These are just some of the things I would like to talk about today as forms of memory that are functions and forms that are more than just remembering and more than just much of the research that goes on in the field of memory. These are more the dynamic and constructive aspects. Uh, researchers spend a lot of time talking about how many types of memory there are. Uh, so uh, I'll need to talk just a little bit about some of these. Uh, there is a kind of memory where we just hold information very briefly, um, such as if we look something up in a uh, telephone book, uh, and then we dial the number and then we forget it, just briefly, it's whole held, it is gone. Uh, and that is short-term memory. Um, and then there's working memory, which is actually like uh, juggling things, organizing, uh, working with the information that we have in our heads and, and restructuring it, uh, reconceptualizing it, uh, episodic and semantic. I'll say more about that, of course, and implicit and explicit memories. Uh, I'll talk about 
as well. So uh, rather than explain that now, I think I'll just jump ahead a little bit to the next slide. So some of the examples, uh, just to give you some idea of. Excuse me, is that better? So, mm -hmm. Yes. Is that okay with you? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so, if you gave two or more of the speakers who were in this series, uh, happen to remember the names of the speakers? You want your identical? Pardon? I, I can name two if I don't okay. know you. Who? I said I can name two if I help you. Well, just, well, what's my name? William <laughs> Hoyer. Okay, who's the other one? Donna Corral. Oh, last week. Yeah. That was a great <laughs> lecture. Was the gold? Gold, okay. And Mary Bird. Mary, okay. Well, Mary Bird. But I can't remember either, so. Okay. Um, that's a kind of memory called... to need to. Well, you have to recall on demand, somebody asked you a question, and you have to recall a fact um, that has a time stamp on it. What happened in last week or a week ago? And it's a very specific kind of episodic memory uh, that you have to um, retrieve when you do that. It's different than uh, that per first picture I had on the slide of a beach scene. Uh, where it might ha evoke something that um, maybe a story or experience that you had when you were a child on the beach um, and what that was like for you. That's a sort of a more of a construction, more of a, an elaboration uh, of a, a memory. Uh, and you could fill it in any way you want to. Uh, it's not really verifiable uh, or testable. Uh, it's just uh, it's just an experience that's part of our autobiographical memory. Um, and what about this? Unjumble the following letters to make a word. Clause. What? Clause. Clause. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I'm very slow in these. My wife uh, up here is very quick in these things. Um, uh, that's why you're married. That's right. <laughs> so this actually involves uh, working memory. Uh, what I was talking about before, <coughs> you really organize information. Maybe if, uh, if you're a lawyer uh, or an English teacher, uh, the, the word clause might have come to you quicker than if you were not one of those things. Uh, but what you might have to do is just reorganize all these letters and, uh, or it might just jump out uh, at you. But uh, if you have to work at it, reorganize the letters and sort of put one thing with another thing, um, it is called working memory. <coughs> um, and it involves uh, use of your prior knowledge about word construction, word grammar, syntax, uh, words that are your vocabulary, and also involves operations of mind, that we call those operations, the working aspects. So a lot of the tasks that we face in everyday life are combinations of all of these things. There's not one form or one singular type, but they all come together again. Uh, children who grew up in disadvantaged trauma or child abuse, would they have trouble, well, one with memory and, and where you say can enhance it? it really wouldn't enhance a child who has grown up in severe conditions or trying to remember things like this when they're worried more about where the next meal is going to come, who's going to beat them. So doesn't memory have a lot to do with the young, their environment too? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, it could be too that different forms of memory uh, emerge for that child who becomes an adult. That what their they remember those experiences. They learn how to problem solve, right? To uh, survive and problem solve, uh, just as many of us have in different situations. So uh, we learn 
um, how to um, function in our world. And that, that is our learning, right? It's uh, tests, yes, yeah, so it's school-based tests. Uh, the disadvantaged child might not do as well, but in other ways, uh, in everyday life learning, uh, that child may do just as well or maybe even better, may have developed a kind of resilience. But aren't we limiting their success if we're saying they're not conforming to school-based learning and keeping them in the situation that they've been raised in, mm -hmm. by doing that? Yeah, but I'm, I'm not going to worry about school-based learning, too. We're talking about adults and ourselves and, uh, how we think and uh, how we've gotten to where we are and where we're going with our, with our own abilities and, and capacities. Yeah. Um, so, uh, more on construction. Uh, so we construct uh, our experiences. Uh, if you happen to have a, a, a perceptual uh, or a visual uh, deficit of some sort, if you had glaucoma or a hole in your macula or a macular degeneration, uh, there's a limit in your visual processing, the stuff that comes at your eye, but your brain and your knowledge compensates for that. Uh, so your knowledge fills in what you can't see sometimes. Your knowledge fills in when you didn't hear what the person said. When, uh, when my wife speaks slowly to me, uh, I think I hear what she said to me, but I, sometimes I get it wrong. Uh, but it's a guess. Uh, we <coughs> take educated guesses and uh, use constructions to figure out signals that we that were unclear to us or uh, inadequate or insufficient in some particular way, visual signals and auditory signals. So it comes up particularly uh, dramatically in uh, in criminal justice, where uh, sometimes in lineups, in uh, in other sorts of uh, situations where. Uh, uh, criminal ident identification processes are involved. Uh, based on a vague or uh, brief image, someone identifies uh, a criminal. Uh, this is what, on the right, is what the image looked like at a distance of 83 meters. And yet the memory of the witnesses, uh, the false memories of the witnesses, were constructed by identifying the face on the left. And this happens uh, fairly frequently in uh, any sorts of identification uh, situations, uh, crime scene identification types of situations. And there's a whole literature in the field of law uh, about, about law and law psychology about these kinds of issues. Uh, also things uh, come up in law too about uh, misleading questions uh, and leading questions. Uh, so when the, uh, the lawyer asks the witness how fast was the car going when it bumped into the school bus uh, versus how fast was the uh, car going when it smashed into the suitcase, you're likely to get very different estimates of the speeds. And so lawyers and anybody can mislead another person just by how things are, are, are said to us and how things are presented to us. And these are all constructions of memory. Uh, they're not things that uh, uh, only some people do. We all do this. Uh, uh, people recall and recognize things uh, that we did not see well or hear well under particular conditions at all ages. It's not just something older people do, but there are times when older people do do this more. I'll talk about that. Uh, and people are, are vulnerable to implanting memories as well. Uh, misinformation, suggestions, especially when the source seems very confident. Uh, somebody who's telling you this is, is very sure about what they're telling you. 
uh, the, safe, the misleading information was very detailed and plausible, and the event was unclear, or it was emotionally upsetting, or it was very brief, or it was dark when it happened, uh, it was quick. Uh, all those situations uh, make it right for uh, a, a misleading uh, picture to emerge from a, from a scene of some sort. I got a call from uh, an old high school friend uh, not long ago, and uh, he uh, started talking about something that uh, occurred when he and I were kids. Uh, we grew up in, uh, in close to New York City, and when we were 12, 13 back then, it was okay for us to get on the bus and go into New York City. Uh, and we would go without our parents. The parents really didn't tell my parents what I did, really. Uh, we just went into New York City and uh, we would go, one time he said, uh, we went to the top of this building that was under construction, way high, and we crawled to the edge of it and looked over. Mm -hmm. I hadn't remembered that. But after he told me this, sure, that we did that. You know, it was like, it, it was plausible. Uh, and I was thinking, yeah, maybe we did do that. But I had not remembered it, and it's possible that it happened. It's certainly now, after he told me, I said, yeah, probably that did happen. So it was a way that I constructed a memory for that experience that may or may not have happened. Um, and this happens in courtrooms and therapy rooms and uh, other places, uh, uh, certainly too, uh, sometimes for good and sometimes for poor reasons. A name uh, that you may have heard of, Elizabeth Loftus, has done a lot with this issue of misleading information. Yeah. I was just wondering if you've ever studied the memory and intuition, the um, connection between the two of those. Tell me more about uh, it, what you mean by intuition. Well, sometimes without having any like, actually cognizant memory of, of something or reason for feeling the way I do, okay. I immediately know that I either don't trust someone or I don't trust a situation. Okay. Or, and I might say, you, we, should, we should definitely listen to our intuition. Absolutely. Uh, in that case, I, I would like to call it a bias. The bias is, uh, has other meanings to it, but uh, we have uh, ways of seeing things, uh, and those are intuitions or biases, and uh, we have ways of processing the political news that we're hearing now in, in certain ways, and those really, uh, we sort things based on our biases. It's, and absolutely those things go together. Uh, it falls under the topic uh, of uh, falls best on the topic of uh, implicit memory. Uh, is so uh, I put up the word non-declarative. Uh, so there's things that we say that we know, but there's a lot that we know that we we don't even verbalize. And things like in intuitions and biases are part of our non-declarative knowledge. Okay, so you're not really calling them. False memories. They're not false memories at all. They can be very true, or, or they can be. Their veracity is independent of uh, of the. Uh, yeah, the veracity is independent. I would say. Let me get back to that. I think it's a, it's an interesting, certainly an interesting issue. I think it comes up um, in another way here. Okay. Are there other questions at all uh, about about any of this? At any time, if you want to uh, have a question or add anything, please please feel free. I, um, Are you saying that in a conversation that Fred said to you, Fred, I remember going to so and so building yeah. and looking over it, yeah. and you just you don't remember it, but then it starts to come back to you. Yeah. Do and you I, think I if he was telling the truth? That would come back to you easier, or was something that he made up, and it doesn't come back. To you. Yeah, so that's where the bias comes in too. This is a good friend of mine, 
He was telling me a very uh, clear, oh, remember that time we went to New York City and it was the top of the Pan Am building and it was a rainy day and it was, this. he had a lot of detail, right, about this experience. And I was just convinced that that's what happened. Uh, and, you know, so it just fit in with, uh, with my experiences. And I, I can't say I didn't remember it first. As he was telling me, it started to form into a memory. That's something that I would have done back then. That's consistent with what we would have done back then. So it worked. Now whether or not it really happened, I don't know. <laughs> Did it ever, after you left Fred, yeah. a couple of weeks later, while you were laying in bed and having coffee, then then, did the thought ever come back to you in visual, nerd, video format? <laughs> I don't want to play psychologist with you. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm saying, I, I think I've had that happen to me. Okay? But I imagine it happens to other people in the same fashion. So you're saying it is later on I could, have, I could have dismissed it. I could have said, oh, that was, that was bogus. Or I could have accepted it entirely as true, right? And it could go either way. In this case, I accepted it. I think it was just something that I did not remember that probably really did happen. And it wasn't even a judgment at that point, just because part of your experience that that's really happened. And this happens in therapy, when therapists suggest things uh, to, uh, to clients. And over a period of time, they start to believe that that's what happened. Yep. Is there a difference between remembering the event and telling of the event? Because I had trouble with word, word, um, word retrieval. Word finding. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Do you say remembering the exact word that you I want to use? I remember an event because when I try to tell someone else about it, I have mm -hmm. trouble with the word retrieval. Mm -hmm. And it, it becomes something that you know, it isn't a simple story to tell you. Sitting there, everybody's filling your words. I have a neurology appointment this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to come with me? <laughs> well, no. But you might have So, uh, I guess I kind of spin off in different ways when you say that. Well, one of the things that occurs to me is that a lot of times with these stories, um, people are telling stories that they've told lots and lots of times before. So they have all the words, they have all the descriptions, it's all like that. But to tell a new story, to remember something new that you haven't told a million times before mm -hmm. to somebody, that's a whole different experience. And finding the words for that is, um, is kind of uh, creative almost. It's a it's a it's a newer process than telling a story that you've told everybody a bunch of times before. So that's very different. And your point, I think, is an excellent one because a lot of our memory isn't so much about the past, what happened to us in high school or junior high, but it's what we got to do tomorrow. It's that important. Where do we have to go? What's our next doctor's appointment? Right? We're thinking of what. Well, I've been told that there's a big difference between memory loss and the ability to retrieve. That we don't, I don't have memory loss because it's in there. It's right. not like I pick up a, a something right. and don't know what it's for. Right. Mm -hmm. I know what it's for, but it's the other. It's like the stories that mm -hmm. you're saying. I right. can't remember the words that the doctor said that it's retrieval. That's right. Absolutely. It's all there. Um, <laughs> the, the computer analogy is. Um, yeah. So the computer analogy is that it's in, the, it's in the hard drive, or it's in the memory of the computer, but the directory is, is not there. So you, a lot of times we, uh, we, we just can't get to the, the words or the story or the information because uh, we can't find the right context for it. It's like walking down the street. And we pass somebody, we know that person's name, uh, but we didn't. 
come to us until we're 25 yards from the direction. But so it takes that retrieval is a little slower. Um, and the way it affects, it, it, interesting it, it, in terms of implications, the way this affects our memory is that recollecting details is hard, is effortful oftentimes about information that we haven't really uh, told stories about a lot before, that we haven't rehearsed a lot. So what we'll do in those cases is go with familiarity. If something seems plausible, Sure, that's it. But we don't really put it to the same scrutiny uh, as we would if we we're really trying to say did or did not this really happen. So, so what I want to say is that familiarity trumps recollection a lot of times. If it seems familiar to us, we believe it we're with memories. You had another question. Yeah, when you were talking with the therapists on implanting memories, yeah. has there been study as far as is it easier to implant a memory into a younger person or an older person? Uh, yes, it's been studied. Uh, what's easier to implant, uh, it's easier to implant in any age if the source is confident, this is for young and old, if the misleading information is detailed and plausible, young and old, and if it's unclear. And unclear, I, I, I wanted to say more about that. It was like uh, perceptually ambiguous, uh, uh, emotionally uh, charged. There's a lot of things that, that make it uh, more likely uh, that there will be a plant of memory to it. And it's true, all those factors are true for young and old. Okay. I think what's more true for old though, older adults, is this idea that uh, if, the seat, if the situation seems familiar, uh, to us, uh, that it's plausible that this could have happened. Um, we'll, we'll take it. We'll, we'll believe it. I think that's more likely uh, for an older adult. The reason I say that is because we've had more experiences, uh, and we use we draw on our familiarity uh, more so than that a, a child might or a young adult might. That's just a guess. It's just my own child. Is there a certain part of the brain that memory is stored in? Yeah. Um, it was really hard for me to oh, okay. not, not, not talk about the brain. Sure. Uh, because that's my okay. problem. That's my, you know, I taught a course at uh, a course at Syracuse just on memory and the brain. Yes. Um, and I did this for. Here for four years, I've this course like yeah. 20 times. So I, I, I'm very fascinated by the connections. Uh, what is memory aging the aging of? You know, what parts of the brain are really underlying all of this? Uh, the, uh, the two areas, I would say, are most critical frontal lobes, okay? Uh, so associative areas. Uh, and also hippocampal, uh, hippocampus area which builds the memories, builds the associations, and the frontal is more retrieval. Uh, but then again, um, how those two, you know, the brain is so dynamic and interactive, the amygdala, the emotional thing is so uh, involved too. If a memory is salient to us, uh, emotionally salient, we better remember it, right? Yeah. So, but if, but if the emotional system is uh, impaired or limited in some ways, perhaps by a stroke or something, uh, then memory is going to be deficient too. So all these things are so interconnected. Uh, frontal lobes, uh, frontal lobes are uh, age pretty quickly. Uh, frontal lobes control not only the, uh, you know, the retrieval, but they also decide to control the inhibitions too. So sometimes people will start telling things without the inhibitions. Uh, uh, but we're talking mostly today uh, about memory without thinking about the subject data which it operates on, because these are the things that we can we control ourselves. These are the things that we can do something about, the things that we construct, 
things that we could help ourselves with uh, and use effectively uh, to stay uh, active and uh, involved. What part of the brain says to you, don't forget your cell phone, brush your teeth, go over here, <laughs> brush your car, go over here? The mother. <laughs> and what part of the brain says you forgot your list of language? Because I think there's three different or four different parts that control those activities. Or so you think three or four different parts of the brain control that? Yeah. But the, I, I only know what a button ball is, so that's right up there. Yeah, the routine. The routine is probably part of the memory. So I would say that if I had to uh, pick pick one answer in a multiple choice test for, for a student, mm. I would say uh, go with frontal lobes. But that you said that is one of the earlier parts that the general. No, I said it, I said it, it's likely to not uh, earlier. I said oh. it degenerates four. Four. With Asian, but not earlier. Not earlier. Well, not, not earlier than other parts necessarily. But like you said, the more you do something, the more you right. right? It locks it in. It right. locks so. it in, so it's almost root movement. Right. You almost right. don't even have to think about it. Roach. 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 Okay. So what would you say, though? You're talking about habits like. Uh, shopping list of weapons and all the routines you do in the morning about brushing your teeth or whatever, right? So we're frontal. It has to be frontal, right? All right. If you say so. <laughs> all right. So I now we're all going to believe that it's the frontal. Okay. I, I, I say most people would prefer. That's where conscious knowledge resides. Yeah. 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 Seems to be the center for the stuff that we know. <clears throat> yeah, so much of uh, the stuff in research is about uh, forgetting. And there's much less uh, known about these constructive, dynamic, uh, vibrant parts of the memory. And we already addressed this already. Are older adults more susceptible to distortions? And I said yes, if older adults cannot remember specific events, uh, the details of an episodic memory, uh, then they tend to rely on familiarity. And individuals rely on familiarity when recollection fails, or whether we decide, oh, it's just too hard to try to remember um, all the details of, uh, of uh, that biology lecture or that, uh, that other lecture that we heard. So instead, we just sort of uh, go with a, a more superficial uh, recollection of it. Or what happened at the movie? So here's some research by uh, a very prominent uh, scientist at the University of Virginia, Tim Salthouse, and uh, he has studied expertise. I've done some of that work also. This is work that he's done with uh, the New York Times crossword puzzle. And he shows the, uh, the number of words correctly completed uh, 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 for actually four different studies across chronological age. So he's looked at uh, crossword puzzle performance in uh, people ranging from 25 all the way into their uh, mid-70s. And what's clear is that uh, people get better uh, at this kind of thing, especially these are things that people do. Right? These are, this is the kind of knowledge that uh, is exercised, is a skill building 
kind of uh, effect. Uh, I've done some of this work in the area of medical expertise to show that people with experience, or older adults with experience, are actually better in terms of diagnostics and predictions. Um, Saltaus and other researchers have studied not only um, crosswords, but they've studied bridge and chess and other game domains and have found the same sort of thing, that older people who play these things and, uh, are actively involved in these things get better uh, in terms of developing knowledge. And it's true for any, any kind of knowledge that we exercise, that we all have things that are important to us, that we learn about, but that we continue to um, accumulate, cultivate, um, and the, these, this is uh, memory as knowledge, and it gets better and richer and more detailed and more nuanced uh, as we grow older. It's construction. But things that are kind of um, out of the blue and on demand, like what can we remember from a year ago today? You know, could we actually go back and try to uh, think about personal events or news events that were uh, ongoing uh, exactly a year ago? Uh, that would be a kind of uh, episodic memory, and it would be hard for us. It would be hard for a, a 20 year old also. Um, but uh, that, that's an example of episodic memory. Uh, uh, maybe a better one is tell me about a movie that you saw recently. And sometimes it's really hard to remember movies, isn't it? What was the movie that we saw? Uh, and, uh, not only that, the plot, uh, the title of the plot, but who you went with and where uh, you saw it and uh, any other things about it also are sometimes hard. Um, uh, my wife and I uh, went to, uh, had a friend who was uh, in the early stages of uh, developing some dementia and uh, a very prominent uh, Syracuse University professor and artist, and he, uh, I would have sometimes, I would have breakfast with him after uh, we had, Joan and I had gone to the movies with him. Uh, he was widowed, and uh, I would talk to him about the movie, and he had no, I had no recollection that we had been to this movie uh, a week ago or maybe even two nights ago. But then I would talk to him about the thing that happened in the movie. In one case, it was the movie about Pollock, the artist. Uh, and he could describe in detail the car crash or other things about the painting. And here he was a painter himself, right? Uh, and, uh, but he didn't remember the source that he had got to the movie with Jonah B two nights ago or three nights ago. So his episodic memory was not there, but his details uh, and recollections about the movie itself, the knowledge itself, was still quite rich and was definitely there. So our source memory is sometimes a problem. Who told you this? Where did you learn that? Julie asked me this all the time. I don't remember that stuff. But I was trying to remember what it was that was said or what it was that read or you know the information itself I extract but not the source when it comes necessarily. Yeah. Is that because you're <coughs> putting in a lot of effort? Uh, <coughs> uh, for example, if I forget a name, place, or thing, I always go through the alphabet until mm -hmm. I get it. And, and sure enough I do get it. Yeah. Is that because you're putting effort into it? Oh. So, because sometimes when you release the effort it comes up, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's true. After uh -huh. it doesn't come up, you'll let it go, it'll come up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this thing about but that alphabet thing really works. The alphabet thing really works. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, but for that's just, it's so troublesome when, when something is on the tip of your tongue and you just can't quite get to mm -hmm. it. And you're trying to 
the letter thing is probably one of the best strategies. Uh, or sometimes just letting it go and it'll, it'll occur to you at a later point. Um, the thing about on demand, when somebody asks you this, you know, asks you a very specific question, you know, what happened a week ago or something like that, those questions are really hard, but then if you have time, or if you, it occurs to you freely or naturally, is that you will find that the memory is there. But just, just the demand of an on, answering a question on demand is very hard, and that's part of what makes episodic memory hard. So delivery of the answer uh, when somebody asks you to. Yeah. Um, a person that I used to um, work with in a, in a store that I, in a health food store. She worked with people with um, nerve problems mm -hmm. or behavioral problems. Mm -hmm. And she mentioned to me how sometimes, if you can't remember something, if you hold your forehead like this, it'll bring out the memory. Maybe not immediately, but within not too long a time. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because there's, um, well, the nerves have, well, they're connected with the skin. In, it relate back to your brain. I mean, your brain is in um, contact <laughs> with all the nerves and the skin and everything. So that when you activate here, it activates your memory part of your brain. Mm -hmm. Not that it works all the time. But Have you found that to work? Yes, yes. Have many, many, I, many times. I've not heard that before. Is that because of effort, though, know, that you're doing something? <laughs> we did your we did, we could forehead. I don't think so because you can really try to be remembering it. Try to be remembering something. I'm here. But that's the thing. Oh, yes, there's a thing. No, I can't go like this. Yeah. I don't know what this you know, is. And you can even keep talking about maybe trying to associate something with it or not. But it'll it'll just pop in your head that that's the memory that you were trying to find. She said, hold your you head. You couldn't hear it. Right. Here. What did you so, suggest? What did you suggest? Could you say this a little louder? Or? Well, we can't see what you're saying. Hold your head. You can't yeah. see where. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I worked with a lady that worked with um, people that had all kinds of nerve problems in their body, mm -hmm. and she mentioned to me that if you have trouble remembering something, just hold your hand to your forehead. And because I I don't remember that she said this was the connection, but um, and you mentioned that was. The front part of your brain was associated with memory a lot, and so that there's. I think what she tried to tell, tell me was that there's connections from the brain to all parts of your body, so that when you go like this, it's hooked up, or the nerve connections are. So that this is connected to the memory part of your brain, especially, and it just sort of helps you to access that memory. Thank you. I, I don't, I've not heard that before, and I don't know any research about that, but it's something I'd like to look into a little bit. And this was like 30 years ago she said that to me, and I, I mean, forever I've used it since then. Sometimes we develop tricks for ourselves that work for ourselves, too, which is a problem. You're talking about the episodic memory. Yeah. It doesn't have a lot to do with the emotion. Like everybody can remember where they were and what they were doing when, say, Kennedy was killed, or when 9/11, where they first heard. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna jump ahead. Okay. <laughs> to here. This is uh, considered to be uh, one of the most frightening movies. <laughs> Of all time. And the cartoon, I'm not sure you can read it, is uh, uh, all forest animals to this very day remember exactly where they were, what they were doing when they heard that Bambi's butter had been shot. <laughs> so uh, I was just in the glen finishing my new burrow when I got the news. I was looking for crawdads in my favorite creek. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, the things that get studied, this was a 1942 movie, uh, and some of you, uh, I, didn't, I was born in 1945, probably none of us actually saw that version. But anyway, we saw this other one. Uh, and I know I saw one when I was about 10 or so. Yeah. So, uh, and we've always been asked, 
uh, you know, where were you when how you heard that he was not doing okay. Uh, I can't use that in my classes, of course, because uh, the college students were bored then. <laughs> uh, so I had to switch to different ones. Uh, where were you when Superstorm Sandy occurred, or Katrina, or some other 9-11, uh, some uh, tragedy that was nationally shared, so that everyone had some, sh uh, some shared meaning uh, to the event, and they can remember not only that, moment, uh, but everything that they were doing, uh, just the intensity of that particular moment. It's interesting, this is a kind of episodic memory, but it's so emotional, it's so intense, that it is um, unforgettable, uh, erratical. Uh, uh, and we have these that are nationally and internationally shared, um, but we also have some for ourselves, um, uh, particular distinctive uh, um, events, positive and negative, the birth of our child, uh, well, kind of our marriage. Explain, but, but, kind of would explain your friend's yeah. memory of Jackson Pollock and the details yeah. of that, because it was emotional for him, yeah. because he was an artist. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but a lot of these personal events that we have that are so uh, salient for us are, uh, are flashful memories. Uh, they're distinctive of recollections of shocking events associated with personal activities. Uh, what's interesting is researchers have uh, tried to assess the, uh, the accuracy of these as they're not necessarily always as accurate as we think. We're very confident that that's exactly where we were and when and what happened and all the And we could even smell the smoke. But um, the confidence is not necessarily equivalent to the accuracy of humans when, when you can actually test those things. So we have flash <laughs> numbers is a, a kind of, um, a special kind of episodic memory that is indelible. What do you oh, call it when you think about JFK being shot yeah. and you lead a rather normal, everyday, placid, easy-going life and you, all of a sudden something is tragic or something that is meaningful or worldly? What is it called when you say to yourself, and everybody talks to themselves, <laughs> self? You never believed this was going to happen. In your whole lifetime, you say that to yourself. What do you call something like that? As you go back. Oh, going back? Looking back. When I look back at JFK being shot, yeah. I, I took it as, as, I took it what two ways. One, it was a normal event, and then on reflection, I say, this is crazy. Yeah. Right. Sometimes it takes us a while to to understand the past, because to put it into a perspective, to really see things, uh, because they, they happen, they're so uh, unbelievable, and it takes us a while to really figure them out in our lives, because and I think we also hold on to memories, well, they're not really memories, they're in our thoughts if we can't make sense out of them. You know, we come back to them, we're trying to, you know, rework these things and try to make sense out of some situation that hasn't made sense to us in our lives. Sometimes, though, so, uh, that we carry that too far, where we're sort of prisoners of our past, where we hold on to something that uh, we wish we didn't uh, hold on to as a memory. A colleague of mine used to talk about, you know, he used to think that I should become a memory doctor that I would fix memories, <laughs> you know, have us focus on memories that are positive and healthy and help help uh, myself and others to uh, not dwell on things that are unpleasant or, or uh, you know, negative, but try to, you know, reconstruct how we think about past events. But yet there is a certain, I think, cognitive need for us to uh, uh, understand uh, uh, events in the world, events in our lives, and, and to make sense out of those. And we usually don't leave those alone until we figure them out. I think it's something we'll come back to. Uh, the 
Kennedy thing, I think we figured it out by now. But there are other more current ones that are really puzzling. Do dreams have anything to do with memories? Pardon? Do dreams have anything to do with memories? Uh, that are free of a time stamp uh, or expiration date. Uh, these are things like uh, facts, geographic facts, or baseball facts, or musical uh, facts. Uh, things that we remember, but we don't remember where or when we learned them. What is the capital of California? Sacramento. Uh, where did we learn that? Arnold Somewhere in grade school. So, so I could say to you, uh, or you could say to yourself, well, I learned that in second grade when we had, you know, U.S. geography for the first time, when we looked at the map, and you could see the map, and they had the states. So, you, uh, and you believe that. I could actually construct a very plausible scenario uh, about when you learned it, but probably that, that may not have been it. You might have learned it. Uh, reading a book um, at home or your parents reading to you or something like that. Uh, so, yeah, we don't remember a lot of the facts that we have. Facts about arithmetic, facts about our language, uh, just world knowledge in general uh, is uh, called semantic memory. And it's free of uh, these uh, sorts of episodic things. And it's also uh, unforgettable for the most part. Uh, we, our language, once we learn it, is there. Really? Uh, yeah. Unless, I feel unless we have, have unless a lot of these things is because it's refreshed memory. Because it's something that I've learned and I keep hearing it and I keep, I'm able to, it's refreshed. Mm -hmm. But there's things that I know that I learned that I don't, I don't remember. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, those, yeah, okay. So, but th so it is. Uh, I think you're right in a sense. The semantic knowledge is the stuff, also the stuff you use. Like, but what was the last time you had to recall the capital of uh, Utah? <laughs> uh, so, but so that's in there somewhere. Um, and you maybe haven't recalled it in a long time, but I would. I also have to certainly agree with you that it's the stuff you use more frequently, like your language and the wording you use, and all that stuff is going to be much more. Yeah, because more I'll read. remember that I knew it after right. somebody tell it to me, yeah. but I could never, like you said, I could never retrieve it. I could never say if you asked me a question, I wouldn't necessarily be able to pull it up unless it was a refreshed memory. <laughs> I think there are bad facts that um, that you haven't used in a while that you would just come back and multiplication tables. You don't know how bad I am at math. Huh? <laughs> I said you don't know how bad I am at math. But then you didn't really <laughs> learn the <laughs> damn memory. <laughs> so if, you, if, you learned, if you learned your multiplication tables well in the third or fourth grade, or maybe I wrote. you still know them, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, and even though you don't use them. Yeah, but sooner or later, if somebody asks you how much is seven times eight, it would take you a moment to say, because it would invite you eight by eight, remember that 64 is that eight. Yeah. Isn't that part of the memory yeah, yeah. process? Yeah. Yeah. So, if you, so if you don't remember the, if 
you don't remember the solution, you remember the procedure, right? So you remember a trick. I can't. I've never been able to remember anything that I want to. I've always had to have like an association and be able to figure it out. So it's like an operational thing, but wrote is not something I can get. Uh, what was your What was your did your field, your interest? Yeah. Oh, I was an operations manager. What is it? Operations manager. Yeah. Uh, so that was a lot of semantic, semantic information was about uh, business procedures. Yeah, and figuring out the most efficient way of doing things. Okay. Yeah. That is all stuff that you will probably never forget, even though you haven't done it in a few years or so. So that's a, that's a, a lot of these examples of semantic information are very uh, are general because we're talking about vocabulary and things like that. But they're also very individualized too. Things that we happen to have learned because of our particular work experiences or our particular hobby interests or the interests of our children, for that matter. You know, we learn things that come into our life that we want to know more about. That we hold on to that stuff. So even though we don't remember exactly when we, it was taught to us. Yeah. This, this question is for that, but yeah. you're talking with somebody and you're getting a conversation and all of a sudden you go blank cool. and you can't, you don't, you don't remember what you're talking about. It'll come back. Yeah. But what, what caused, I mean, mm -hmm. what we want? Maybe <laughs> 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 Or distraction. Uh, yeah, a distraction. Yeah. Uh, I, I think one of the things yeah. about working memory is, especially if we're, you know, like driving and trying to not just tell the story you've told before, but do something complicated, uh, or think about all the stuff we have to do in a, in a sort of playful, uh, deliberate, uh, conscious kind of way, we're going to drive more slowly, right? Uh, so we adjust our uh, our tasks to our cognitive demands. And if we're thinking a lot about one thing, a lot of times uh, we will maybe have a lapse on another thing. So, so is there anything you can do? I think do fewer things. <laughs> I can't do much. Concentrate on the one thing. Be not like a, uh, a twenty-year-old and try to do twenty things at once. Oh. If the person you're talking to is paying attention, they could they could tell you what you were doing. But they forgot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I got to watch my time here. Um, so, I want to show you, this, Claire tells me that this is going to work, so let's see if it will. Uh, yes. Central on ABC. Check this out. Scientists are still mystified by how we retrieve our memories. Each one of us has about 500 trillion synapses in our brain. If we could access all of them, it would be like having an entire library of Congress in your head. So, could solving the mystery of Jill Price and her memory turn us all into living libraries? Once again, Diane Sawyer. As we now know, Jill Price has a unique brain that can, in effect, relive her life day by day, including watching the TV shows she loved. I tested her memory with random clips. This is all in the family. Can she guess which episode from a few seconds? You ain't ugly. <laughs> Nineteen seventy-five. She had her baby on the twenty-second um, of December, nineteen seventy-five, and this was right before. She's right. By the way, she once helped work on a retrospective for CBS. Like who shot Jr. And I would, you know, explain what was going on and what, you know, what had happened, and, and so it is useful in that respect. What was the date of that episode? 
who shot JR was on March 21st, 1980, but we found out who shot JR on November 21st, 1980. And I can tell you what, was do what I was doing in both of those instances. Final episode of MASH? February 28th, 1983. And I can tell you what I was doing that day, and it was raining that day, too. And what about the theme songs? Rock for Files. We brought one to try to stump her. Lansky's Beauties. No? I've never even heard of this <laughs> show. <laughs> Lansky's Beauties aired only three months in 1977, and she was just 11. Today, she works as an administrator at a religious school. Her job history, as unsettled as her life. She says she was 12 when she realized she'd begun to live two lives at once, the present and the past. Her mother, Roz. She was not easy. <laughs> and that's because everything that was going through her head, she couldn't explain. Her brother, Mike. There were things I would think to myself, why don't you just get over that? <laughs> she doesn't. It was hard for them because they didn't really know what to do for me. My brother is totally opposite of me, so they didn't, you know, I'm screaming and yelling and crying, and, and they didn't really know what to do for me. You can see the toll it seems to have taken on her year by year. This profound lesson she teaches about our memories, our lives. Is it possible our happiness and survival come from what we choose to edit, to forget? Because you said at one point that we have no idea how much of ourself is created by editing our memory. Right. And to shape that. ourselves. Right. And I don't do that. And I still feel bad about stuff that happened 30 years ago. But we all do it. I mean, we can all remember one or two things. It's not one or two things. Everything. And I, and I really, like, live it and feel it. And I think, God, if I had just done this, then I wouldn't have done this, and I wouldn't be here, and I'm always constantly doing that. Her father, Len, a Hollywood agent, looks back. Most of us are like that oyster that has a little piece of grain of sand. It builds a pearl around it to, to smooth out the sand. And that's what our memories are, really. We forget all the bad things, or a lot of them, or they're dulled. The, the dulled emotions are dulled. But with, with Jill's, she's right there. For instance, her mother, a dancer, remembers saying the usual one or two things about her daughter's weight gain. Jill has the days and dates. She'll not realize that she said it 500 times. She'll think she said it one time. And it has caused a weight problem for her. But there's nothing I could do about it anymore. Jill wants us to know that too much memory living in the past is paralyzing. It, it's uncontrollable. I, mean, I actually think it should be like in a mental hospital because this is, makes me crazy. But I figured out a way to live this. I mean, think about your junior year in high school. Now, what can you remember? <clears throat> Dr. Cahill and Dr. Bagal of the University of California, Irvine, say there's something else they've learned about that mysterious part of Jill's brain which is larger than usual. It's an area associated with OCD. We believe that uh, she has strong tendencies toward the, the obsessive compulsive. Could her brain be storing an infinity of memories, just as some OCD patients hoard things? We don't think it is an accident that the tendency to collect is both for objects and for memories. We think these are related, and we think that the brain does it, and we want to figure out how. Save things, hoard things? I don't like the word hoard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I have the first doll that was put in my crib. I have the first gift that was given to me when I was born. This is my notebook from senior year in high school. Well, drug like reading. Have you tried drugs? What kind of drugs? Antidepressants. <laughs> that doesn't work either. There is only one thing that did make a dramatic difference. 2002, she starts conversing online with a man named Jim Price. They meet, fall in love, and marry. He just got me right from the very beginning. And 
we laughed all the time, and he just, he was my best friend. When she and, and Jim were together, it, it seemed like that was gone. It didn't matter. You know, all the baggage of the memories that she had were, uh, were kind of put away. For a few years, she had doctors to help her, a husband who adored her. Then, two years after the marriage, tragedy. Jim, a diabetic, died of a stroke at the age of 42. Another day to relive in full pain over and over again. And we could say, time heals all wounds. Doesn't for her. Her best friend, Wendy Lavoy. I think she's brave. And I think she has a lot of courage. And she's my hero because of it. I don't think she knows that. She will. Before we go, she brings something for me, an article from almost 40 years ago. I was in my 20s. I don't remember at all of this. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, you're the White House. is freaking the White House. In her book, The Woman Who Can't Forget, she says she's trying to learn to live forward, inspired by her husband, learning to laugh at her difficult gift. What's so great about Jill is Jill will call me on any any given day and she'll say, Wendy, do you remember what we did 20 years ago today? I'm like, you're kidding, Jill. I don't remember what I had for lunch today. The little cerebellum. At the same time, the doctors hope she'll help unlock the secrets of Alzheimer's, of genius, and the way all of us remember. I don't want to go too crazy here, but it could revolutionize is maybe too big of a word. It could profoundly influence how we think the brain stores memories. All right, I'm not sure I'm going to do one more. <laughs> I'm going to do one more. Shakespeare in Love wins seven Oscars. March 21st, 1999. Well, I give up. <laughs> I told you, you I surrender. Can't stop I surrender. Jill Price told Diane Sawyer she decided to share her story because of the memory of seeing a confused woman in a bank dressed in a bathrobe clearly suffering from Alzheimer's. Jill thought, how can I have so many memories while hers arose? She hopes her new book, The Woman Who Can't Forget, out just this week, will help others. And you can read an excerpt at abcnews.com. We'll be right back. <coughs> what are your questions, guys? Oh. Yeah, it's disturbing, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> How do we deal with memories that are maybe very emotional, very hurtful, very sad? If you wake up during the night and they pop up and they're all so clear and every detail of that particular event is right there happening at that moment? Well, if I could just say, I think that's what she was doing, right? So mm -hmm. we would talk about flashbulb memories, like when, where were we with JFK? Was mm -hmm. shot, or where will we when 9 11 occurred? But for her, everything is everything. Like that. It, the amygdala, the part of the brain that gives emotion to things, uh, is so associated with each thing. She watches too much television. So. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but each event gets so uh, amplified emotionally yeah. that it becomes. So that it's unforgettable. Her, her memories are all like that. Uh, your, your example is uh, uh, you know, something from waking up yeah. with a vivid memory. It's uh, you know frequency wise, it's you know much less. Her whole experience seems to be like that. TV. How do we deal with kind yeah. of regressing those so they don't happen so yeah. often or right. so frequently? Right. Or? right. Well, what it, what I think. How do we do that? Well, just watching this video makes me not want to do that because I want to focus on not so much the past but but forward. You know, Maybe thinking, thinking about of happier times. Or yeah, happier. using using memories in a forward way to overpower to, those memories, thinking of other to not be prisoner of, of past unpleasant mm -hmm. memories and to use my cognitive abilities positively toward what I want to do in the future. Yeah. Just the, just the thought. Does the brain have a limiting capacity to how much intake it can take it away from? 
or something. Yeah. They say it's not not limited because we you know we retain probably most of the things that have ever happened to us are, are still there. Who's the question? What was the date of that video, or when that book was published? I think 2012. Could be 2013. So it was recent. It's, oh yeah, it's quite recent. Okay. Uh, and she walked in, yeah, just as it said, she walked into the lab at UC Irvine. Uh, here I am. And they didn't believe her at first uh, with this. And then they started testing her. Uh, and I have some things here I want to show about her brain also. So she's still oh, yeah, involved she's, in this research? Yes, yeah, she's still being, still being studied at UC Irvine. Right. Uh, she's not the only one. Oh, no, that's right. There, there's since this. Actress, well, I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember. And I'm, she has been on TV. The actress right. has yeah. as well. That's right. Several, With several recall. more individuals have come forward since yeah. this since this book uh, about uh, just this kind of extraordinary episodic memory, uh, which has again, as we can see, pros and cons. Right now, do you think that she used this to become? Uh, CEO of uh, you know a Silicon Valley corporation or anything? No. Uh, so this, despite this extraordinary memory, it didn't serve her well in terms of career or personal life. Uh, I heard this, uh, and I'm wondering what you think of it. It's an analogy. I'll make up the numbers. It makes no difference. When you are five years old, you have let's say fifty thousand marbles in your brain, all are red except for one. So when you're looking for the one, it doesn't take long to filter through all of those. By the time you get to the age that we are now, you've got 20 million yeah. or whatever incredible number. And so you still have all those red ones and only one white one. It takes a lot longer. Retrieval is slower, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And because we have so many other memories, Sometimes it's harder to find that name or that face or put a name to that face. That particular detail that we're looking for is harder because of all the other information that's there. Absolutely, that's one of the one of the theories of, uh, of delayed retrieval. <laughs> but 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 so the uh, one way support for that and a test of that is that we can retrieve things more readily that we use more frequently, right? So they use it uh, more frequently, kind of thing, keeps those memories more active, right? The, the positive ones. I'm trying to make the association between her memory and OCD. Uh, Okay, what, can you just really quickly, can you just... Yes, I can. of TV programs and details. Her uh, executive function scores, uh, frontal lobe scores, uh, tests that are designed to re measure executive function uh, are actually relatively poor. So you would, again, this example is extraordinary because she has this extraordinary episodic memory, but she has uh, very, below average executive function and overall intellectual scores. Uh, so executive function is measured by a card sort test sometimes. So you, you see that on a computer, something like this, and you pick uh, one of these, and it could be a match to red, or it could be a match to number, uh, 
or it could be a batch to shape. So uh, you go along and you pick the ones you want, and then the, uh, the uh, experimenter tells you uh, to switch concepts, to switch to a different dimension. Uh, so if you were doing it on the base color, now you have to do it on the basis of number or, or shape of object. And she could not switch categories as well as others. She was obsessing on the one thing. And it just took her more trials, more effort, a bit more errors to switch to the other kind of thing. So her executive functioning and reasoning scores were showing impairment on Wisconsin card sort tests. Uh, in, and other measures of frontal lobe function were showing impairments, uh, despite this remarkable, mm. you know, memory for details about TV programs. Uh, and other kinds of uh, straight out recall tests, straight out memory tests, not so good. Is this like it's about? Um, <coughs> yes and no. A savant uh, um, it was more of about a very a narrow, specific skill, uh, a musical skill, a particular talent, uh, uh, artistic talent, maybe. Uh, so no, I think this is more of a, a memory quirk. Sorry. This may not be, I apologize, this may not be easy to see. Uh, the researchers uh, asked uh, Jill about her recollections for every Easter. She was Jewish. Uh, so they asked her her recollections about every Easter from 1980 to 2003. Uh, and this was produced in 2003. Uh, and these were her entries uh, for that. And they've done other things where, so it was not just TV stuff that she was remembering. She could actually, uh, now it's not hard to remember a particular holiday, um, a particular uh, Valentine's Day, or, or Christmas, or New Year's, or Easter, or or uh, Yom Kippur or something. But um, to do this for a bunch of years, you can get them mixed up pretty easily, right? Uh, and she was able to keep them all straight, which was, was kind of interesting. So she's doing all this despite uh, a fragile neural substrate. How do you test whether that was accurate? Well, these were, these were verifiable by family. And they had other things. Um, I took the slide out of Other things well, about actual dates. Pictures, by pictures, by pictures or something. Pictures, parents, yeah. si she had the, a sibling, uh, so she was able to verify. This was all verified. So. Yes. How would they remember? That's right, how would they remember? Somebody else. <laughs> 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 Maybe they were all a little bit. <laughs> Hey, Louis, I just want to say, okay, yeah, and I'll, again, I think it's time to, uh, to close. And in summary, I just wanted to say that uh, these are the things uh, that are uh, constructive and dynamic about our memory. They're also puzzling, but these are things that we can build on and use in a positive way. Whenever uh, we hear the thing memory aging, uh, we say, oh no, it's going to be decline and, uh, you know, negative. But yet there's so much you know, that is a very uh, positive and active about memory processes that we use uh, to support our, our thinking and our good decision making. 
uh, to adapt and to compensate uh, for the changes that occur. So memory is thinking, it provides the basis for future actions and inactions. It's the basis for our mental health. Uh, and I think memory is smart. And memory aging is smart. Well, I'll conclude that way. <laughs> Go ahead, everybody. You can clap. Don't get me. <laughs> There's going to be a test tomorrow afternoon <laughs> what went on here today. But well, can you remember to get it here, get here at least. Okay. I was reviewing a lot of things as Professor Boyer, Boyer was talking, and I can't collect or recollect anything that was so important in our lives, at this stage of our lives, of what we heard today of what we learned today and how important memory really is. There's good memories, bad memories, but they're memories. And I want to send a word to Janet Weinkoff, if she's hearing, about how important this aging study series at the Manliest mm -hmm. Center has become. Tell your friends what great things are happening here, not just at the center, but in particular at this particular series. We've just got three or four more events that relate to this aging study series. And next week, a lady by the name of Karen Doherty is coming, and he's, she's going to say, what did you say? What did you say almost reflecting <coughs> tangents into memory? She's great. The, Karen is great. Okay. She's doing great. And she's going to speak on changes in hearing in older adults. So the hearing, the memory, and the uh, <laughs> yeah. and what you said all relates to, to, to each other. What day? Next, we we'll return Wednesday. to Wednesday. Yes. Wednesday. Yesterday was a holiday, so we moved it to today. So, but thank you for coming. Uh, uh, is it, as a personal sharing, this is a kick. This is a true kick to be able to bring this to the event and everybody enjoy it and to see the, mm -hmm. the smiles and the reflections and the thank you on your faces. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.